His real name was Yeshua Bar Yosef. But when I was young, I couldn't say it right. So I just called him Shua, and the name stuck. I was an only child. My mother died in childbirth. My father grew kind of angry throughout life, and I paid for it. My first memory of him was when we were like six years old. It was market day. All of the farmers would come in from the countryside and come down to the village square with all of their goods, and Miriam, Shua's mother, would take him with her. And I tagged along with our friend Aaron, and we noticed that she always went to this old one, Uriah, never could figure out why she went to him until this day. What I noticed that Uriah did for Miriam is he would take her jar, fill it with grain, shake it, then fill it again. And then he did something else. He took Shua's smock and he made a pocket and he filled that with grain as well. I mean, that was a bonus. None of the other farmers ever did anything like that. Well, the ladies all kind of gathered around to share their news of what was going on in the village. And we three six-year-olds get kind of restless. So I dared Shua to run across the square back to his house without spilling any grain of wheat. Uh, double dare! He clutched that thing to his chest so tight and he ran across the square and Aaron and I went running after him to follow him. Oh, we chased chickens aside, we knocked over a couple kids, and all the way behind you could hear the mother screaming at us. Well, Aaron decided to kind of make Shua laugh. So he started trudging around like old Uriah, which got Shua to start laughing. The grain started spilling. We we're on the floor laughing hysterically while from behind, danger approached. I don't know if you know, but you know, we have more sparrows in the Galilee than we have people. And they came to this wonderful feast of the grain that was on the ground. And I mean, the birds just came from everywhere. And I remember Shua just looking at them and kind of like trying to protect his head. And then all of a sudden he became mesmerized by the birds. And he went down and lifted them up and the birds flew up and around and he'd smile and he'd laugh. And all of a sudden, he'd start spinning with the birds as they flew around him. Danger approached from behind. Well, you know what mothers are like. Shua spilled the grain. Aaron made him laugh. It was my idea. We were all guilty. It was left to our fathers to correct us that night. And I remember after my father got through with me, standing mm -hmm. in the doorway holding my behind, listening to the noises coming from Shua's house. You know, the scriptures, the book of Proverbs says, a man who does not discipline his child does not love him. That night, we were loved. <laughs> I took to spending more and more time with Shua, at Shua's house, visiting with him and dreaming in a way that his parents were my own parents. I became like a little brother. And that's what I called Shua, my brother. Our village is a bowl in the hills, and Shua used to love to run up and down those hills as often as he could. And I'd be sitting in the square, he'd go tearing through, and I'd say, where are you going, Shua, where are you going? tall, skinny. His legs would take him up much faster than mine. And I have to say, wait, 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 wait for me, wait for me. No, come on. But he'd wait and we'd go up the hills together. I remember one time my father was enraged at me for some reason, I don't know, but he shook my hair and begged him to stop and he threw me out of the house and I fell on the street. I sat there 
cried my eyes out in shame and humiliation, and Shua came by. He was staring at me. I had bitten through my lip, and it was bleeding. Where are you going, Shua? Where are you going? Where are you going? Come on, he said. And together we went up to the hills and we sat on our favorite rocky ledge overlooking the plain of Estralon and he let me tell him all about my father and me. He put his arms around me, he let me cry, we sat. And after a while we started talking about all the famous battles that had happened on that plain below. And the day wore on and we just sat there and swung our legs and talked. For a time at least everything was good. Whenever I needed him, all I had to say is, where are you going, Shua? Where are you going? He'd understand. <clears throat> Our circle of friends included Jude, James, Joseph, Aaron of Wonderful Humor, our local Billy Rubin, and Eliezer. We called him Ellie. I think Shua liked him the most. We all played our games together. I mean, wonderful games, like kickball with an old goatskin ball that had to be at least as old as Esau. We played pretend games like Moses in the Wilderness or Joshua at Jericho. Da -da 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 -da. Pretend wedding, pretend funeral, pretend, ooh, pretend funeral. I mean, that's an important game to play. You could be the rabbi. You could be the professional mourner. You could be the member of the family. Or you could be the body. Boring part, but important. Shua had an awful time as the rabbi. Awful. He never could always get the words out. He'd see one of us lying there as the body, and he'd start crying and sobbing. I remember one time, Ellie was the body. Shua, Shua, I should be in the ground by now. Well, we'd say it's just pretend. But I remember one time men killed a rabid dog and Shua snuck around the back of the house and sobbed at the death of that dog. When he was small, this might surprise you, he had a stutter. Now, I don't remember that we made much of it, but when we went to shul and started learning the scriptures, the stutter got worse and it caused him endless anguish. Rabbi Mordecai ben Ezra, oh, the lion of a man, used the repeat method to teach. He'd say the lines of scripture at the top of his voice and we'd have to echo them back at the top of ours. It is mercy I desire. It is mercy I desire. And not sacrifices. And not sacrifices. And we'd sway because you could physically enter the words of the Lord God, blessed be he. It is mercy I desire. <laughs> Rabbi Mordecai was a bit anti. He didn't like those people up there in Jerusalem. And the we in the countryside, we had the real thing. And he wanted us to know that. So we just kept following his tune. It is mercy I desire and not sacrifices. But for Shua, words had become a merciless enemy. I'd hear him next to me. It is mercy I... I desire, and, and, and then he'd hear himself. And he'd get upset, and the stammer would get worse, and people would make fun of him in the class until they were caught by the rabbi, and they were cut dead by his stare. I got a little tired of defending my brother's pride, but the fight had just begun. There was an old woman who lived in a shack about two miles outside of town. She couldn't come into town because she was a public sinner. A woman of the night. A prostitute. She was dying. 
Like so many old whores, she was out of money and starving to death. And we all knew this, but shock turned to outrage when word went around that Shua had taken the fish his mother had made for the Shabbos meal and brought it to the old whore. I mean, a Jewish boy at a prostitute's house with a gift? Ay, 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 tongues wag. People held their hands to their heads. I wanted to defend my brother, but I have to say I was embarrassed too. Rabbi Mordecai advanced on Shua's house. Half the town behind him. Spawn of Edom, get out here! Shua came out along with his parents and he was shaking and Shua was pale and his stuttering awful. What, what, what was that you say? asked the rabbi. It is mercy I desire and, and, and not, not sacrifices. The rabbi was startled. He reached out and he grabbed Shua by the ear and every one of us winced because we knew what that felt like. Maggot of Philistia, do you realize what you have done? One of my students making themselves unclean? Unclean? We're going to the ritual baths. And as he led Shua to the ritual baths, of course all the kids followed. Get him clean, Rabbi. Wash him up good, Rabbi. Teach him a lesson, Rabbi. And the Rabbi turned around and looked at us and said, and is the old woman to starve then? Punishment for her sins, Rabbi, punishment. So, Reuben, what punishment is there for your sin of presumption? Reuben wisely said nothing. <laughs> and Rabbi Mordecai ben Ezra and his student Yeshua bar Joseph marched off to the bath. By the time of his bar mitzvah, people in my village regarded Shua as a nice boy. Odd. Punished by God for some sin past or present in his family. But his reading at the bar mitzvah, that was a disaster. I mean, he couldn't even get out the words of his own chosen passage. The spirit of the Lord is, 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 is up, up upon me. People were polite. Reuben was his usual smug self. Ellie and I died a thousand deaths for him. And in honor of his coming of age, his parents took him down to Jerusalem, where for three days he tried to talk to the scribes and ask them questions, but of course they couldn't understand a thing he said, and they ran out of patience. And so did his parents when they couldn't find him. Our village is like a big clan. I mean, we're all related in some way. That's all it is, a clan. And when Shua came home, relatives were upset. They were angry at the way he treated his parents. And I remember sitting in the square, and I watched Shua go by with his head down. And to tease him, I said, where are you going, Shua? Where are you going? He didn't look at me. He didn't look at me at all. He kept his head down and practically ran up to our rocky ledge. And I followed him stood next to him on the ledge, and I saw his face covered in tears. What's wrong, Shua? Come on. I touched his shoulder, and he brushed my hand off. I didn't know what else to do, so I said, well, Shua, what's wrong? You cannot talk to me. I, I, I'm like your brother. He looked at me. He clenched his fists. I... I can't talk to anybody. I, I can't find the words and nobody no, listens to me and nobody understands anything I say. What? What's wrong with me? You know, there's a time for words and there's a time to be far from words. I remember just putting my arm around him and got him to sit down and let out all the grief. It was good for him. It was good for me too. But Shua was put to the test a few days later. It was late afternoon and all of us were hot and bored and Reuben was spoiling for a fight. And so we're sitting in the village square. 
And Chiba was sitting the way he liked to sit, one leg straight out, the other one under the other foot, and he was doodling in the dirt, circles and nonsense stuff. And Reuben calls out, hey, Shiva, how come you got lost in Jerusalem, huh? Hey, hey, stupid, I'm talking to you. Oh, leave him alone. Oh, sure, really. Defend him. Go on, defend him. You're always defending him. Let him talk for himself, if that's what you call what he says, talking. Hey, dummy, you forgot you had parents? What is it, Shua? You want to be a scribe? Shua looked at him and said with a little delight, We all stared at him. I mean, we have about as much chance of becoming a scribe as any of us do becoming Tiberius Caesar. Even Reuben was astounded he gave up. But I remember thinking, at least he dreams. Chua dreams. That's more than the rest of us do. He dreams. Though now I think at times how good are dreams. I wanted to be a carpenter like Joseph and Shua, not a weaver like my father. So my father disowned me, threw my belongings into the street. I was 15. Oh, well, it's okay. It's okay. It was the end of things. But Joseph took pity on me, and he welcomed me, and he trained me in the art of carpentry. And Shua and I would go out, and we'd cut the trees, and we'd haul in the logs and throw them up on the supports so that we could saw them into planks. I remember my hands bleeding and getting blistered. I didn't care. I loved it. I loved being with Shua. Sometimes I'd sleep on the roof of the house where it was cooler, and he'd come up and he'd sleep there with me, and sometimes we'd sit in the moonlight and we'd talk. We'd talk about our work. We'd talk about Israel, our ambitions. We'd pray together. We'd read the scriptures. Sometimes we'd get into wrestling matches, and I do remember this one Olympian wrestling match. I almost had him pinned, except dirt went down into the living area down below and Joseph came upstairs. We got some love. When we were 18, we went to Sepphoris to work. Now, Herod Antipas decided to rebuild the town um, after it had been destroyed by the Romans several years before and he was calling out for construction workers. So the eight of us who had grown up together, we all went. It's only four miles away. And the pay was good. We made new friends, even among the Gentiles. We learned Greek. We learned a little Latin. And we camped out at Sepphoris behind Ellie's cousin Simon's house. And Simon had a younger brother, Joshua. Well, Simon was a wiry man with intense eyes, and the word was he was a zealot. So he didn't hang around too much. We hardly ever saw him. But Joshua would sit with us every night. He was a big guy for 14, but he was a carpenter like Shua and me. We'd have these wonderful, passionate discussions around the fire, sometimes ending in fights. Aaron would say something like, the trouble with us is we have no feelings about anything. And suddenly two of us would be rolling around on the ground trying to prove a point of some kind. You know, we knew that we were the remnant of Israel. We knew that the kingdom would be born. What would it be in our time? Would we see it? I mean, the Romans were punishment for our sins, but the occupation can't last forever. And after that, Israel would be restored. We were sure of that. I mean, we wept about it. We dreamt about it. We argued about it. We prayed, let it be in our time, O oh God. But what happened instead was terrible beyond words, and it changed our life. It was Friday the day before Sabbath. Word came that an attempt had been made on the Roman prefect's life as he rode from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So in a rage, the Romans raided Sepphoris. Now, they burned it to the ground 16 years before, so they come and they capture 10 men who they said were zealots. They got to Simon's house and they didn't find him there, so they took his brother Joshua. And they crucified the zealots and Joshua with them. And they nailed him to his own wood and put a sign over him that said, Simon did this. 
And as the sun set for Sabbath, the victims remained on the crosses, screaming and cursing, guarded and mocked by the Roman soldiers. And for us that night, there was no joyful songs of Sabbath. There was only one song. My God, my God, why, why have you abandoned me? Yeah, we sang and rocked and wept for his cousin. And when he couldn't go on, she would finish the song for him. He was 14. Grown men could not endure the horrors of crucifixion, and, and Joshua was 14. He was a kid. Just before dawn, I heard Shua getting up. So I opened my eyes, and he was taking his water skin and putting his cloak on. Where are you going, Shua? Where, where are you going? Joshua needs me. Come, come on, come with me. But he's got to be dead by now, Shua. We can't help him. Shua started to move off, and I caught his arm. Shua, you can't. It's the Sabbath. Go back to sleep then. I was frantic. What if something happened to my friend? But it's clear nothing unnecessary needs to be done. We could do nothing for Joshua. Nothing. But I took my cloak, and I went with him. We came to the crosses. It was... On. The soldiers were gone and only a few were still alive. They were pulling themselves up by the nails and trying to breathe and then they would collapse back down in agony. I remember their voices were thick and raspy. And there was thirst was like an axe at their throats and everywhere flies, huge black flies covering the victims and and biting into their wounds. But when we came to Joshua, he was only hanging a foot above us, his head down on his chest, his lips drawn back, his teeth bared, his staring at us, and the flies all around his face. And Chua reached up to give him some water, but the water just dribbled out of his mouth and fell onto his chest and the flies pounced on it. Suddenly I saw movement coming down from the road. Someone was riding at us. It was a centurion. He saw us. Shua, come on, come on. And Shua says, come on, let's go. But he pushed my arm away and he turned around and he faced the Roman soldier with the horse and he grabbed onto the horse and he <clears throat> grabbed it and said, Lama, Lama, why? Why? And the horse reared up. And all I remember is this cape billowing out from behind him, and it's red. It's spread like all this blood around us. And I see the Roman reaching for his sword, and I only had time to say, Shua! And the soldier slammed the haft end of his sword into Shua's skull. Next thing, I remember I'm sitting on the dirt floor holding my brother's body in my arms. And he's bleeding from the nose, from the mouth, the eyes, the ears. His blood covering my hands. And in the stillness of the morning, I only heard the occasional scream and the flies, the drone of the flies. I was there with my brother and wept and kissed him and stared at his blood on my hands. And I looked up, and that Roman sat on the horse looking down at me, laughing. I understood. You see, the Romans stripped us because they knew we were modest. They crucified us prior to the Sabbath because they knew we were religious. And now that Roman smiled because he knew that our country was his, and he knew that I knew it, and he smiled. turned on his horse and rode off. I got Shua back to the camp and eventually home. He lay unconscious for five days. Only his shallow breathing told us that he was alive at all. 
His mother wept over him and bathed him. I held his hand and kept squeezing, and Ellie kept talking to him. And Joseph sat at his son's feet, his shawl over his head, praying, I have watered my bed with my tears, oh my God. I have become like those who go down into the country of the dead, but you will rescue my soul. Into your hands I commend my spirit. On the fifth day, Shua opened his eyes. In a short time, he was able to eat and to move around. But then whatever sympathy <coughs> there was for us <coughs> led to arguments and confusion in the village. And as far as many people were concerned, Shua and I had broken the Sabbath. <coughs> Our act of mercy was futile. It was blasphemy. Rabbi Mordecai came to see Shua. He remembered, he inquired about my brother's health, and I remember him standing in the doorway, looking out into the square with the wind gently picking up the fringes of his cloak. And I remember he suddenly seemed very old and very frail. I have tried, tried to teach as the Lord God, blessed be he, has given me light. Not only Torah have I taught, but what is the heart of the Torah? Not the innovations of the Pharisees or the politics of the Sadducees, no. I have taught what is essential. What all of them has never possessed. Passion, commitment, and the total gift of the self to the Holy One and to the Holy One's word, total. Yeshua, did I not love Joshua as well as you? Would I not have given my own life to keep the nails from his body? But one day was given to us by the Lord God, blessed be he, one day on which we can say, he is Lord, he alone. We cannot undo all the pain. We cannot undo all the suffering. And we cannot undo all the death. We are not master of the universe. He is Lord. We are not. We are not. And you, Yeshua bar Joseph, could not give him that one day. And, and, and is the old lady to starve then? Yeshua, that was different. No, no, Father, no. Taught me well. And he kissed the rabbi. A few days later, the eight of us who worked in Sepphoris were sitting around the fire. Again, Reuben is breaking sticks, throwing them into the flames, looking directly at Shua and saying, the one thing that we have is to be a Jew. That one thing that keeps us from the filth and degradation of all the nations be a Jew. Our most precious possession and some would betray even that. Nobody said anything, not even Ellie. I mean, it was terrible silence. And Shua got up, came closer to the fire and said, the day we went to the crosses, I saw a man. He was leading his oxen to water. It was Sabbath. I understood. I understood what? Get to the point. Shua whirled around and reached down and grabbed Reuben by his tunic, hoisted him to his feet and said, the point is a man can give cattle what they need on Sabbath, but I can't give a boy on a cross a drink of water. I think Shua must have seen the fear in Ruben's eyes because he opened his hand, stepped back, and then all of us stared at him. He went back and sat down next to me. I mean, no one spoke with him. What could he say? Just before we went to sleep, Shua said to me, I never thanked you enough for what you did for me. A man can have no greater love. Shua, I broke Sabbath. Do you think so? 
Yes, I do. I did then. And I do now. Nothing was the same for the eight of us in the years after Joshua's death. I mean, life took its natural course for most of us with marriage, raising families. But as we got older, the bond of our youthful days, it weakened, it disappeared. I mean, every night all the men would go into the synagogue in Nazareth, discuss the scriptures and pray, but the discussions always ended in anger, and our prayer became tense and miserable and uneasy. Aaron seemed more and more restless, as if he didn't enjoy being with us anymore. His humor just turned and bitter, and we all worried about him, and he was just different. But you know, more often than not, it was Shua who caused the trouble. I mean, night after night, I watched him drift away from us. I remember one night we were discussing the coming kingdom of Israel. Rabbi Isaac, our new rabbi, because Rabbi Mordecai died, oh, he disliked Shua intensely. You are to not to learn Torah. You are to be students of the law. You are to be the sons of Torah. You are to live it, to breathe it, to be Torah. When you are so, you will sanctify the name and God's kingdom will come. There's more that we have to do. We must teach those who do not know Torah. We must rescue the outcasts because they have no one else. It's not your job, Yeshua bar Joseph. You're called to live Torah. They have Moses, they have the prophets. Just as we do, let them learn. Jude trying to get some peace in the discussion, said, Shua, does the prophet not say that the kingdom of the Holy One will come when he writes his law in our hearts and there will be no need for teachers? No. No. I mean, just like that, no. I mean, you could feel the anger mount around him. No, we must do what I Isaiah said. We are to be servants of all. We are to open the eyes of the blind. We are to unstop the ears of the deaf. We are to tend those who need us. Now, what about the Romans, Shua? I mean, should we open the eyes of them too, Shua? I mean, shall we unstop the ears of the Romans, Shua? Do we tend the Romans, Shua? I don't know. I don't know. But those words, every man that had been listening to him walked out of the synagogue except for Ellie and me. When they had left, Ellie stooped down and picked up a handful of dirt and placed it in front of Shua and said, have you forgotten what the Romans thought of Joshua, Shua? That's what they think of all of us. Ellie, I have to speak the truth as, as I see it. Are, are, are you afraid of the truth? I'm not afraid because it's true, Shua. I'm afraid to hear it because I love you and you are tearing us apart. Ellie, no, no, Shua. No more, please, no, peace, shalom. And he held Shua's face in his hands. He said, shalom, Yeshua bar Joseph. Enough. Joe and I were sitting alone in silence. No more? There was more. We heard that Aaron had stolen money from his father, called him an impotent fool, and then went off and lived with the Gentiles. So now my own belief is that I have to regard Aaron, my dear childhood friend, as dead. One day, news came to us of some reformer down in the south, a John the Baptist guy. I mean, all of us were excited to hear that we thought this man just might be announcing the coming of the kingdom. Several of our men went down to listen to John. They came back very impressed, studied Torah much better. And Shua went down to see John. Gone for a year. Poof, gone. His parents seemed to accept his absence with some sort of serenity. I saw his mother barely survive illness, his father trying to do the work of two men, and I was the one who heard the criticism in the shop. I was the one who heard it in the marketplace and in the synagogue. 
Well, what are you asking me for? How am I supposed to know anything about him? Am I my brother's keeper? I was a little ashamed, I have to admit. But then it happened. I was out on a job, and Joseph was working with a boy apprentice, and the support poles cracked, and the logs Joseph was cutting fell on him, and he lingered only about a day, and then he died. That just man was mourned by his wife, by his cousins, by his many friends, and by me. But every tongue and eye said, where's the son? Where's the son? Where's the son? One day, months later, we were sitting in the marketplace after work, and a figure appeared by the well road, tall guy, rather thin, face turned black by the sun. Shua? Shua! I mean, he strode right up to us. We all stood and we stared at him in silence. I mean, he gave us the full, solemn greeting. Three full kisses, holding each of us for a moment with his eyes. Ellie and me, the longest. Brothers, the kingdom of God that we have sought for so long, it has come. The kingdom of God is within you. No trace of a stammer. Every word was clear and strong. He found his words, and none of them made any sense. Shua says to him, where have you been? Your mother? Ellie, come with me, Ellie. We'll tell all of the Gentiles. All of the Galilee must know this great news. Y'all come with me. We'll tell them together. Shua, go home, your mother's a widow. Cruel of Reuben, but it was real. Shua looked over the doorway, saw his mother. He went to her, and she took him in her arms. I went with them to Joseph's grave, and Shua threw himself on the ground and sobbed, and I wanted to scream at him, where were you? Why weren't you here when we needed you? Three days later, Shua is holding Shiva for a total stranger, a tax collector, living in the same shack as that old whore had lived in and died. But if Shua hears about it, he goes, he buries the man, he holds Shiva for him, as if anybody would care to comfort anybody that dealt with a leech like that guy. And Shua throws dirt over his head, he wails for the man as if he cared about him, and then he refused to bathe, making himself clean so that no one could come into contact with him because he was unclean. Shortly after that scandal, the Romans came to our village requisitioning. That's their word for stealing all of our food. We stood on the sides of the square in utter silence and just watched them the way you watch insects in the dirt. Shua walked out to a soldier who was standing in the middle of the square. He took a piece of bread, he broke it in two, and he offered it to them. I mean, that's a sign of hospitality. It's a sign of brotherhood. How dare he do that? But he did it. The soldier didn't know what to do. Don't eat it. He may have poisoned it. You know what these Jewish rats are like. See, they don't think we know Latin or Greek. She would know exactly what they said. The Romans think that we Jews look like a sore rat of Rome. That's the problem. So Shua takes a bite out of each half and offers it to them again. They looked at him and said, he's crazy. He's crazy. And they turned around and left. When the Romans left, Ellie walked up to Shua. Who are you? Where's my friend? You know, he left here, gone a long time, and never came back. What did you do with him? The kingdom of God is here. The hatred must end. <laughs> See, it's never done among us. No matter the cause. And I know Ellie was sorry because he instantly reached out and wiped that spittle away. He left the square. 
Ellie, Ellie. Didn't come back. Nor did anyone. They, I mean, they all left the square. And Shula dropped the bread into the dirt and just stood there. For some reason, I knew where he'd be that night. I decided I'd go up and reason with him. But I didn't. Because when I got there on the ledge, I heard him sobbing. Abba. 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 Now he mourns for Joseph, I thought. Now, when it's too late. His last day with us was a market day. He was sitting outside his house. The market was full of turmoil as usual, but people were avoiding him and his side of the square. I was sitting by the well, and Shua was looking at every person and thing as if he'd never seen them before. I mean, his eyes would linger on various people, on the animals, on the shopwares, but then I felt his eyes at me, and I could not look at him. And there was silence in the square. I looked. It was Aaron. I mean, he was filthy. He was dressed in gentop rags. His face was gaunt and bore the marks of disease. He was looking across the square to his father and his brother, and he was staring back at them in disbelief. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, please let me come home. Please. Aaron's father shook and said, I had a boy like you once, but he got lost. I had a younger son, or son like you once, but he died. And the old man turned and left the square. Aaron ran to his brother and clutched his arm. Please, brother, intercede for me. You must. How can I be a brother to a thief, a Gentile? shook off Aaron's hand and walked away. You know what happened, don't you? Of course you do. She will run right up to Aaron, embrace him, and said, you can stay at my house. That's right, Shua, take him in. Trash belongs with trash, garbage with garbage. But to give Aaron his due, he shook his head and said, no, Shua, no. I will not bring shame on your family. And Aaron turned around and slowly trudged back down the road he had come. Shame? What shame that isn't here already? Family? I have no family. And a short while later, Shua left us. The next thing we heard of Shua was that he was in Capernaum. He was preaching and healing and forgiving sins. Shua forgiving sins, I'm sorry. I mean, the group following him was more deluded than he was. I mean, they called him Messiah, Messiah. <laughs> A carpenter from Nazareth. I mean, they never came to ask us. No, no, no one ever came to us. It was madness. His mother and I and some other relatives went down to talk to him. His disciples told him his family was there, and Shua looked at the scum that was gathered in front of him and said, here is my family, here's my mother, here's my sister, here's my brother. Shua said that to our faces. And when he took that insane parade to Jerusalem and they crucified him, you will understand if I say we were not surprised. <laughs> I don't mean to sound harsh when I say that. I really don't mean to sound cruel. No one should die that way, no one. But he should have known, he should have known. I think what hurts the most in all this, it wasn't me or my people who deserted him when he was in need. We weren't the ones who left him all alone to face his enemies. We weren't the ones who finally broke his heart. 
It was all those who cared for him who did that. Yeshua gave them everything he had. Even the love he used to give to me. And it meant nothing to them. That's what hurts. That's what hurts so bad. Because, you know, I still see him. Over and over I see him and he's standing there and he's holding that water skin and he's saying to me, come on, come with me. And I'm saying, where are you going, Shua? Where are you going? Where are you going? So, talk to me about the story, not about me, the story. I'm getting old, I gotta sit more. What struck you in the story? Anything sound familiar or not familiar? A little twist here, a little twist there. Linda. Camera disappeared. There was, there was an intro. I just I performed this at one time at a retreat for um, some of our Caribbean brothers in, in Brooklyn, and I was on Long Island. This guy got really ticked about the stammer. He was perfect human being. He wouldn't have had a stammer. I'm like, mm -hmm. he was perfect. He was a human, fully. That's what it says. That's what the doctor says. He was fully human. And then at that same conference was some of the cerebral palsy who had a stammer. And that person said, this is the first time that I feel that Jesus understood me. Other reactions. I think Nazareth is going crazy out there now. I'm sorry, I can't. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Ron. It's a very countercultural to the culture of his day.
He actually does fulfill the second rabbi's thing of you are to be Torah. He was being Torah. You had your bullies as well, yeah. Any others? Just a reaction from this, this whole thing itself. He wasn't calling Joseph, he was... That the character, the character saw that as now he's run for Joseph, hello. When in actuality, what Yeshua is doing is using that diminutive, that not diminutive, the um, I see no face and can't forget the right word, the intimate word of, of, of Abba, which means daddy. And as a child uses it to daddy. It's not the, form, the formulaic one that we use in English, a father. He's using a very loving, loving term. And I think that uh, that's what I like about this piece is that it just brings that, that intimacy. Actually, one of the Psalms. <coughs> Study Psalm 20. <coughs> yeah, no, the, Jesus knew his scripture. <laughs> Look at Psalm 22. Study Psalm 22. The whole of the passion is right there. That's it. We have to evolve in our. And the, the, for me, the important part of this, and one of the reasons we're doing this during this Holy Week instead of other things, is it's the question where are you going? And it's an important question we all have to ask ourselves. Where are we going in our spiritual life? Where are we going in our discipleship? Where are we going in our relationship with God? Where are we going? And that's, that's an important, important question that, yes, it's used on a friendly basis, in a kind of like a teasing basis between the friend, who's never named, by the way, and Shua. But it's a question that we all have to answer for ourselves. Where are we going? And in this time of transition here, it's an important question. And it's all about better discipleship. Why we are who we are is about discipleship, not because we want to get numbers to fill up the church. It's because we want to be better disciples. And in the better discipleship, we spread the gospel. And when people see the gospel being lived, when we are Jesus' Torah, which is the quoting from Isaiah, helping the blind to see, loosing the fetters of prisoners, helping the lame to walk, giving housing to the homeless. When we are that, 
not just doing it, but are that, that's living out the gospel. And if we're going in that direction, then that will bear fruit out there. Go ahead. Linda. Anybody else? If not, there are copies of uh, Shua uh, out there for $10. It says $8.95, but I rounded it up to $10. All of that is going to go to the uh, clergy d discretionary fund, which basically is nil right now. So this will be one of the ways of uh, funding that. Okay. So Cheryl is going to be out in the, uh, in the hall upstairs at, at the vestry table. I love how they own that table. <laughs> uh, and you can buy, buy the books there, and I appreciate Cheryl doing that. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.